Before introducing today's presentation, I wanted to tell you first about a program later this week and then give a preview of next week's Renfrew Colloquium. Uh, Wednesday, March 23rd, tomorrow at five o'clock, New York Times columnist Charles Blow will give the Africana Studies Distinguished Speaker Lecture via Zoom. Starts at uh, five o'clock and it's titled uh, the Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto. And uh, you can just search for Charles Blow on the U of I website uh, to get the webinar registration link. Or you could just email me, kbird at uidaho.edu, and I will share that information. But uh, if uh, you are a regular reader of the New York Times, you may be familiar with Mr. Blow's column, as well as the opera uh, that was based on his memoir, Fire Shut Up in My Bones, uh, which was presented by the Metropolitan Opera and live streamed at the Kenworthy last fall, a terrific uh, um, musical adaptation of uh, his life story, uh, well worth, worth watching. And it will be on great performances on PBS on Friday, April 1st. Uh, next Tuesday, March 29th, will be another hybrid in-person and Zoom presentation for the Renfrew Colloquium. Our speaker will be the Honorable Molly Husky from the Idaho Court of Appeals, who is uh, the College of Law's jurist in residence uh, this month. And she will be speaking about Idaho's court system, what we do and how we do it. And uh, Judge Husky is a graduate of Moscow High School and a double vandal, having earned both her undergraduate degree and her law degree uh, here at the U of I. And we're delighted to uh, have her as a, a visitor, a distinguished scholar for uh, next week's Renfrew Colloquia. Uh, today, though, we're taking a, a step into the recent past uh, with a look at community history in the time of COVID, uh, telling stories about the community video co-op. And we have four presenters from the library, uh, Robert Parrott, Evan Williamson, Han Wendong, and Milo Muse. And uh, I will uh, turn it over to Robert Parrott, who was the special collections librarian, uh, to get things started. So uh, thank you to the uh, library team that has put it together. And uh, Robert, I'll let you lead off. Thank you very much. So as the special collections librarian, I always have to bring actual stuff. I'm an actual stuff librarian. So I brought a couple of different things to take a look at here. The first is a DVD, um, in case there are any of you who have never seen a DVD before. <laughs> which is not impossible in 2022. So um, they generally come in a plastic case like this. They are round. They often have images on the front. And then there's a reflective surface on the back that you wanna try not to scratch or touch. And a laser reads that uh, shiny surface um, and then uh, magic happens in a movie plays. So that's uh, what would have most recently been rented at the video store of the DVDs. Um, but also, um, more speaking to my generation, there were VHS tapes, which looked like this. And this is a very sensory uh, memory for me is to pop a clamshell like this. So that's a great sound and feel. Um, and so these VHS tapes actually have, if I can just start destroying the videotape, um, there's actual film in the cassette that's run from reel to reel. So a VHS player would actually run the reels. Um, and run tape by a projection device. So, um, so yeah, I love, love that clamshell click. All right, let's see. I'm going to share the screen and share our presentation here. All right, so we're talking about Main Street video and oral history of the last video store in Moscow, Idaho. So at their peak, which was around the year 2000, there were approximately 30,000 video stores in the United States. And as of 2020, there was approximately 2,000 stores. So this is definitely an industry that's in massive decline. Um, and uh, we were looking specifically at a particular video store, which is the Howard Hughes Video Store slash the Main Street Video Co-op 
um, which has uh, existed in Moscow since 1978. It was initially actually part of the Howard Hughes appliance store. Um, and if you're here in Moscow, that would make sense to you. If you're not here in Moscow, that may make slightly less sense to you, but it was attached to an appliance store because starting in 1979, they began selling VCRs. And so it's hard to sell a VCR unless people have a reason to want to watch things on a VCR. So they started renting videotapes as a way to drive sales of VCRs. Um, and throughout the 80s, there were several video rental stores in the area, but ultimately about the time we hit 2000, um, Howard Hughes was the only video store left in Moscow. It was still attached to the appliance store at that time, but it separates in the year 2000 when the appliance store switches locations, the video store stayed in the original location. And then again, when uh, the video store element of it was sold, it moved again to its final location in 2007. Um, and, then that, and then in 2018, it transitions to the Main Street Video Co-op. Starting around 2015, uh, the video store owners started to think of it as no longer really being a viable business model. They started looking at the co-op model for having a video store. It took a full couple of years for that transition to happen, but ultimately in 2018, it became a co-op. Uh, there was a $200 buy-in to be a, a, a customer owner of the co-op. And then you could also just rent movies there as well without having to be a member or having to be an owner. And it made it a few more years under that model until March, 2020, when I guess something major happened in the world and the Main Street Video Club was finally unable to keep persevering um, and Moscow lost its last remaining video store. So uh, the idea of the library adopting Howard Hughes stock had been floating around for several years, um, probably around that 200, 2015 date when they were trying to look at closing the business. Um, they began to uh, talk to the library about the possibility of the library absorbing uh, their existing stock. At the time, they wanted uh, $20 per DVD as a sort of a flat fee. Um, and we did the math on that. And while you came out ahead at $20 a DVD on a few things, on most things you were coming out behind, especially since they were rental DVDs and were, had been uh, well used. Um, so the library declined at that time, but those negotiations kind of simmered in the background for a while. And then when they hit the point where they were actually closing down all the way um, and they transitioned to a co-op, uh, we were finally able to uh, have a negotiation where we accepted everything that was left over after they did their sidewalk sales and they donated the Criterion Collection to the Ken Roby. Uh, the University of Idaho Library Special Collections adopted everything else that was still left. Um, so while these mysterious artifacts would enthrall future generations, we wanted to find a way to contextualize them now. We had questions like, how did this happen? Did COVID kill the store? Could anybody have saved it? Does anybody care what happened to the store? And to this day, we continue to be asked what happened to the movies. And one of our inspirations for this project was the Netflix documentary, The Last Blockbuster. The last blockbuster in North America is in Bend, Oregon, and it still exists to this day. I checked right before this and they're still open. Um, they're still selling t-shirts uh, for the last blockbuster, um, which is interesting because uh, Blockbuster was actually kind of a nefarious chain that sort of killed off a lot of the mom and pop stores. And so the fact that they've sort of been well down to being a mom and pop store themselves is sort of an interesting turn of events for Blockbuster. But, um, but uh, this was a, a documentary where uh, filmmakers went in and, and talked to uh, this manager who was very successful at keeping this last, block, this last Blockbuster alive by very much adopting that community video store model. She knew the regular customers by name, knew what sort of movies they liked, um, was able to give a very personal service um, in a way that Blockbuster certainly didn't when I was a Blockbuster customer um, in the 80s and 90s. So that was kind of one of our inspirations saying like, you know, we could do a, lack, a last Blockbuster type thing for the last video store in Moscow. Uh, so what we had going for us was that nobody involved had any experience um, that was a great foundation to build from. Um, but the library had previously supported other oral history product projects that were conducted by others um, in the university. We had a, a, the Gay Rodeo Project. Um, we've had uh, some other oral history projects. So structure-wise, there was some sort of tertiary experience with how perhaps an oral history project might be displayed um, and might be put out into the world. But for actually like on the ground doing an oral history project, Nobody involved had any direct experience. But what we did have was lots of internal enthusiasm. 
Um, I put out a call to see who might be interested in participating with this project, and we had uh, 17 library staff members at the first meeting. Um, and trying to uh, wrangle 17 people on a project like this uh, was an interesting experience. Uh, we had uh, the 17 people, we had about 30 different takes on what we should be doing. <laughs> And so I'm um, trying to narrow that down into what was practical. Um, we had some ideas that are actually still floating out that I wouldn't mind doing, like doing a podcast associated with it. We might talk about like movie recommendations and turn some of the uh, audio that we captured into audio interviews as well. Um, I think it's probably one of the things that we haven't done yet that's most likely to happen. Um, doing things like a film festival uh, would there certainly be of interest, but of course then you have some licensing issues, um, things of that nature. But uh, over the course of about a year, year and a half, we worked through the process of educating ourselves about how oral history is conducted, um, since it is a formal discipline and there are people out there that do have a lot of experience and there's a lot of good resources out there for learning how to do a formal oral history. We, we sort of self-trained up in that. Um, we narrowed it down to a scope of our project that we thought was realistic when we were looking at doing this during the pandemic, um, doing it with the resources that we have on hand. Um, and so we settled on uh, what we'll talk about a little bit more in this presentation, but we were able to settle down to a core group of people who were really committed to seeing this project through, uh, the bulk of which are part of this presentation. Um, Courtney Berg is another person that was really involved and unfortunately is not presenting today, but was definitely uh, instrumental in making this project come to fruition. And so ultimately we were learning as we went, which was an interesting project. It's um, something we haven't traditionally done in our special collections or our library, but it was it's uh, oral histories are definitely a developing area for uh, special collections and for historians. And so we were very happy to have this opportunity to learn how to do that uh, with this topic that was very compelling to our local community. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to my colleague Conlon. Okay, thank you, Robert. Um, I'm Hamon Dong. Uh, I'm the uh, instructional technology librarian here, and I will be talking about the project planning and the educate uh, the execution. So first, we have to determine the scope of the project, uh, interview formats, whether we just want to do the audio only, or do we want to supplement it with some video uh, interviews as well. And then the budget, the timeline, personnel, who is going to be the interview. Uh, the interviewers uh, who are going to be the interview subjects, and then some other documents and forms that we had to uh, create for this uh, specific project. So as far as the scope goes, um, so this is, we uh, developed a project charter by the special collections here. So the charge was to augment the existing collections that we received in addition to the DVDs, VHS, and some other materials that we, uh, that we inherited from the Main Street Vito store. We also wanted to document the history of the store and the collection, given that a lot of folks in the community, they probably care about the whereabouts of the stores and what about what happens to the, uh, the DVDs as, the, uh, as Robert has mentioned earlier. And then the goals, first we want to establish a digital project. We have a lot of digital projects that are made available on the library's website. And so we figured that this would be a good project. Uh, for, uh, for the web as well. And we wanted to deliver an interpretive, an interpretive presentation. And uh, thanks to our student, student fellow, uh, Milo, and he will be talking about uh, this uh, presentation that he's going to be working on in just a little bit. Uh, so first we have to figure out the equipment that we are going to be using. Uh, so we have technology considerations and locations. We have a, a special, we have a, a studio room in the library that's very equipped for audiovisual production. We have a variety of different microphones, uh, audio recorders, and we also have cameras if you wanted to uh, have videos for the interviews. And we have a variety of different software, and then we have to figure out where we are going, where we are going to be storing the files. Are they going to be, are they going to be stored? on the SD card, or they are going to be stored on extra hard drive or um, in the cloud somewhere. And then as far as the locations, uh, we tested many different rooms in the library. We also explore some online options using Zoom and Team. And we decided to go with Zoom uh, due to many different reasons. One is that during the pandemic, it's really hard to uh, it's really hard to maintain social distancing when you are doing an interview, one-on-one -on -one interview with someone. And uh, if you are doing Zoom, then the participants, they don't need to wear any, they don't have to wear a mask. 
they can just be in their uh, uh, residence and they should be able to access the, um, access the, uh, the interview as long as they have the, uh, the Zoom link. And also that because of your, we are using Zoom, uh, we'll take care of the video side so we don't have to set up like a separate camera. Um, so that's very convenient uh, for that. So we decided to go with Zoom. Then as far as the budget goes, uh, we spent less than $2,000. Most of the money was spent on paying the interviewers. Uh, we estimate that it's going to be less than 80 hours of total footage. We also purchased four, uh, four sets of webcams and headsets. Uh, we gave one set for each uh, interviewer. We also provide additional sets in case that uh, the interviewees, they don't have the equipment to, uh, to participate in the interview. Um, here's our timeline. So first we had to identify who's going to be conducting the interviews. So this is a list put together by several library employees based on their suggestions, who do we think will be good interviewers based on their past association with the video store. And then we sent out a call, uh, we reached out to potential, uh, potential candidates, and then we sit down with them to conduct the interview. And then we selected two interviewers uh, for this project. Um, and then uh, the interviewers, they finished all their training uh, in February, and then they started their first interview in spring, and then they finished the last one in summer. And then the special collections, they process all the interviews, they listen to them, uh, they created the metadata, and then Evan helped set up the, uh, the website, which he will talk about in, a, in just a little bit. Uh, so here are the two interviewers that we chose for this project, uh, Monique Lillard, uh, who is sitting with us in the audience today, and Bo Newsom. Monique was a formal, Monique was a formal uh, U of I uh, law school uh, faculty, and uh, recently she retired, and uh, she used to be a frequent customer of the video store. And Bo was a uh, uh, past. Bo was uh, work at the video store for several years before he took on this project. And then we also had to create several other uh, documents and forms for this project. First one is to develop a list of interview questions and then to come up with a, a list of the potential interview, interview subjects uh, to contact. Then we, we uh, develop a consent form to make sure that they agree to be interviewed and give us the consent to use the, uh, uh, to use the final interview uh, to be able to put them up on the website and then create an email template for the interviewers to use to introduce them to introduce themselves to explain the significance of this project where we are, what we are hoping to achieve uh, by the end of the project and then because uh, because this project has to do with uh, human real human subject research and so they have to be taking the training uh, to be uh, to comply with the IRB protocol so overall, uh, so here are the, some major features of the, all the interviews. So they conducted, they conducted the first interview in March of 2021, and then they finished the last one in August. Uh, they, between Monique and Bo, they completed a total of 34 interviews. Monique completed 22, and Bo conducted 12. Of all the interviews, the, the total length uh, was 35 hours, a little, a little over 35 hours, so on average about a little, a little over an hour for each interview on average. And then the shortest one was 21 minutes and then the longest one was almost two hours. And uh, because we're using Zoom, so one of the advantages that the folks who are uh, participating in the, in the interview, they don't have to be located physically in town. And so of all those uh, interviewees who disclosed their location, uh, majority of them, they, are, they, were located, they were located in uh, Moscow. Uh, several other ones we were able to reach out to, including those who resided in uh, Nashville, LA, and Seattle. So here are all the, or the majority of the interviews uh, that Monique and uh, Bo conducted. There were two missing uh, because uh, the, the other two individuals, they chose not to have their uh, uh, video portion turned on. So, uh, we don't have their faces showing. But uh, all of these interviewees, they were associated with the video store one way or the other. Maybe they work at the video store, maybe they were frequent customers. And then we might see some familiar faces uh, like uh, Kenton, like Russell, who work at the UFI. And then here is Courtney, 
uh, who really provided a lot of uh, uh, support and uh, conducted a lot of, uh, uh, did a lot of um, like a metadata editing and the indexing. And uh, also, we also have uh, uh, Bo and uh, Monique, they were, they interviewed each other. So they were on here as well. Uh, so here are all the subjects uh, mentioned in the interviews. Um, so Courtney really did a lot of work on this one. So um, among all the top ones that were mentioned in the number of interviews, so we have uh, business, store ambience, uh, streaming video, and then we also, a lot of folks also mentioned like the DVDs, VHS, film history, filmmaking, and so on. Uh, next, I'm going to turn it over to Evan to talk about the digital side of things. Thank you. I'm going to uh, quickly check that. All right, good. <laughs> um, all right, so um, with all that work uh, from Hanwin, Robert, Courtney, um, also Devin Becker, who I think we haven't mentioned yet, all that planning and coordination all sorted out. Um, we have all these interviews collected by our great interviewers and interviewees. Now we have this wonderful oral history collection that we've collected here at Special Collections and kind of stored away uh, in our digital archive. But the next step, of course, is, is access. Um, openings up to the pu public and letting these stories be told uh, and discovered. And so we actually already have um, a draft digital collection up. So I'm going to pop that in the chat. And then I'm going to try to um, share my screen effectively. Uh, if this works uh, and I'm gonna make this bigger if I can. Uh, and so um, just to give you a sense of, uh, uh, so we have this uh, a draft digital collection up and it's live on our server. So I put that link in, you can visit it. This isn't the final digital collection, but this is, we like to put this stuff up as soon as we can, um, put the content and this data up so that we can start exploring it ourselves and, and you'll really learn more about uh, what this content is, is like um, for ourselves. Uh, and so you can go and preview it as well. Um, and just to get a sense of what these interviews look like, we're going to take a look at this uh, short trailer that was created by Hanwin um, with clips from uh, the interviews. Oh, I think we moved here, well, you moved here in 1994. Right. And at the time, everybody had a VHS, VHS. yeah, yeah. And, and it was just natural. You just assumed that there was a video store in town. I mean, I just remember when I found the video store, I just was like, you know, this is a cool town. This is a nice town <laughs> to have a place like this. I like the feeling of walking into Howard Hughes. It felt um, like a friend's house. I mean, we yeah. went there so often. It was like, it let's was, go here. Let's go get something yeah. for something fun to do this weekend. Uh, and so I think that that social experience around the, you know, around popular culture, around the film industry and the television industry uh, is something that's that's lost, right? It's no longer a place where you go and you meet people and see people. Mm -hmm. um, and as inevitably happens, right? You go in, you're, you're very rarely mm -hmm. there and it's like, by yourself, right? You're there and like, oh, you run into so-and-so and you run into this other person and talk about what they're what they're up to, what they're checking out. Um, and so I think that kind of active social space uh, is what we're missing mm -hmm. uh, in the community. There is something satisfying in the tactile experience of walking through the store and looking at the physical boxes that the movies go in and just being able to touch them and have that sensory experience. And you don't get that from the streaming experience. We were kind of a, a family in there. Everybody, you know, we knew everybody and, and it, it, it's just, uh, you know, everybody wanted to work in the video store. I mean, it lasted longer than, it's like a, it's kind of a keystone business for a long time. Because it was one of those that was just here along like longer than most of the restaurants, you know. It's a mutual thing where where I think downtown made the video store better, and then the video store made downtown better. Um, we, it's just such a thing for all the businesses downtown in Moscow uh, uh, that has always made it so special to me. And a lot of people didn't know it existed, and we. Um, 
introduce them to it through all of that labor of love of of creating the co-op and those are you know some of my best memories um howard hughes uh brought um <clears throat> would uh was a reason that our family um, became really close. Um, it brought us all together and uh, we talked about the films and uh, it really um, helped us um, really want to be who we wanted to be. I really benefited from them existing at all. And uh, it's been, I still have, I will always have like really fond memories of, of them uh, cruising the shelves and finding different obscure titles that I would never have found otherwise, especially in the, the era, the pre-internet era. Yeah. Um, and just so grateful for them to have been in my life. All right, so uh, that gives you a sense, uh, I hope of uh, the content in this collection. And um, you can go there now, as I said, and visit these uh, 34 interviews. You can um, browse through them here. And if you click on one of these images, you'll see that you can uh, view the video. We have them hosted on YouTube, which really simplifies the infrastructure um, on our end of things. Uh, and then you'll see there's kind of the video and you can watch it right here. You can go over to uh, YouTube. And then on the other side here, we have um, what we call metadata in the library. So just all the information, the description of what um, what this interview is all about. And there's some really interesting stuff that we have in here. Kind of the association with the video store is, is a subject. Um, we have subjects that they talked about. This was mainly um, done uh, by Courtney, kind of trying to describe the contents of this uh, collection so that you can browse it in different unique ways. And then um, Courtney actually went and extracted recommendations that people made uh, inside uh, the interview, which is uh, going to be some really interesting things to explore um uh as we develop this collection further so right now you can see here's uh all the recommendations apparently the most important one is star wars um and then uh you can see that quite a few people apparently like all the president's men or a couple people do uh, so it's going to be kind of a neat, a neat thing to be able to explore this further uh as we um you know work with this collection uh you can see some of the subjects that people were talking about this is uh the the types of uh um interviewees uh, their relationships and also uh, some of the things that they talk about in um, in the interviews. So we'll be able to, uh, as we develop the collection further, be able to use that data and really um, allow you to, to use it. Um, we also have up here a draft of um, the inventory of the films that are actually in special collections that we inherited um, from the co-op. So we have 14,700 entries currently, and it's a very basic one. We'll hopefully be able to in enhance that a bit. But you can see the kind of material, um, DVDs, VHS, um, the genre as it was described um, by the, the co-op, and then the titles in there, just to be another way to explore all of this, uh, this stuff that's, uh, uh, that's in the co-op, or that's in the, in the library now. Uh, and then we have a kind of description of the, the uh, collection and um, a background that was written uh, in special collections to give some more context about um, the history overall in the timeline uh, of the, the video store. So this is just, as I said, you know, a very basic um, start uh, to this collection. Um, and we're going to be going further um, uh, from, from this, con you know, building something around uh, this content. And uh, so um, we do have a number of other oral history projects that we've, that have been based at the University of Idaho. So if you go to our digital collections and you go to our oral history, um, here are some, uh, five that, that we currently have up right now. And so uh, there's a couple older ones, uh, Lake uh, County Oral Histories and Selway Bitterroot Wilderness Project. So there's uh, some um, precedent for, for the librarians being involved in this sort of activity. And then there's these uh, three more recent collections, the Idaho Queered, um, Voices of Gay Rodeo and Controlled Shift, um, which you know I welcome you to go explore as well. Um, and, and these uh, collections, have a bunch of visualizations and features um, to be able to explore um, the transcripts and the contents of the of these interviews and be able to, to dive into it. Um, and so those features have been actually refined 
um, into an open source project called Oral History as Data that is led by Devin Becker. Um, and those features like this uh, uh, visualization here and the ability to, to be able to trans look at the transcripts and, and search through the transcripts on the items and kind of jump uh, inside those videos, that will eventually be built into the Main Street um, video co-op collection as well. And so the collection right now that you see is built on um, a framework that we call Collection Builder. This is an open source project that's developed right here uh, at the University of Idaho, um, centered at the digital or Center for Digital uh, Inquiry and Learning. Um, and it's developed by myself, uh, by Devin Becker and Olivia Weichel. Um, we're all librarians. Um, and it's a framework for building digital collections. And, um, and that's basically what you're seeing here. And this is allowing us to kind of be able to build these very unique um, collections or uh, digital websites that kind of reflect the collections and be able to express it in a whole lot of different ways and build uh, unique and interesting features. So there's a lot of projects that we have um, up and you can go to the CDL website, um, cdl.lib.uidaho.edu uh, to be able to view some of those projects, um, most of which are actually built on the same uh, sort of framework um, and in collaboration with faculty across campus. Uh, and so, um, we're going to be, um, as I said, we all these projects kind of build on each other. So we'll be able to, to work on these these items, these other kind of features that we've developed in other projects and, and kind of um, use it um, on the starting point, this draft uh, digital collection to build out um, the kind of features that we want us to help uh, with access and uh, with the storytelling potential of this Main Street video project. Um, we hope to add more content. Um, and more data to explore. So the transcripts are not up yet, but we'll be getting those on there. Um, we have a web archive of, of materials that are related to Main Street video. We have some photos and documents and we have um, better inventories and all of that we hope to be able to publish here um, to be able to you know, tell some stories and tell some narratives and also just open it up for other people to look at and explore and, and do research in. Um, and from that kind of data and content that we can gather here, we'll be able to create some new features, uh, create some new ways to browse and understand the collection, and then overall just provide um, more context uh, for all of this, for the story uh, in our community, um, and for uh, the collection um, that you that you can view here. So as part of that goal, um, library funded the uh, Main Street Video Project Fellowship, and this is designed to um, support a digital scholarship project that is going to explore um, the history and significance of the video store uh, rental video rental store. Um, to Moscow and, and to the university community. And so in um, 2022, this fellowship was awarded uh, to Milo, who's with us today. He's a, uh, uh, an MFA student um, in nonfiction uh, who's just gotten underway on this work and really grappling with that content and thinking up new ideas. So I'm going to pass it to Milo to um, promo that for, uh, for um, a few minutes. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, so I'm Milo. Um, I'm the fellow for this semester. Um, I'm currently making my way through the uh, interviews. Um, and so it's nice to have Monique here. I feel like I've spent a lot of virtual time <laughs> with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm still sort of in a space where I'm thinking a lot about the material that's in there. I'm sifting through it, sorting through it, um, uh, letting it kind of sit with me for a bit. Um, and uh, one thing that I'm really thinking about is how can the digital space um, that we use for uh, dispersing this information, how can that feel like uh, not just a video store, but this specific video store? Um, and so how can we recapture some of um, the ambiance, some of the um, sociality, some of the uh, like curation, the like spontaneity of like happening upon something that you wouldn't find otherwise. Um, and so I'm thinking a lot about that um, as I'm thinking about how to present and organize uh, this information. Um, and I'm mostly just really excited and, and happy to be doing it. So yeah, that's me. Oh, let's see. I'll see if I can share our screen again. You're currently sharing the web, so uh, or the, the Stop sharing. Yeah. And I will share again to get back to our very exciting slideshow. Is that our last slide? I'm coming soon. 
Um, so discuss this a little bit. So there's uh, a link if you want to know more about the student fellowship, we do have a link to that information as well. Um, if you want to know more about that, feel free to contact us and we can share that link with you. Um, and then we're definitely open to questions. And we recommend the movie Be Kind Rewind with Jack Black and most stuff. Yes. So take inquiring mind you want to know, can people come in here and borrow the videos? So right now the videos are not acquisitioned in a way that makes them open to circulation. Um, but we could probably work with people if they needed to see one of those videos. So in general, you're not going to be able to walk up to the circulation desk and check it out the way you might check out a library book. Um, but you can certainly come talk to special collections, either in the reading room or contacting us online. Um, and we can see what we can do to make those materials available. Eventually, we hope to have them actually cataloged and the idea is they would eventually circulate. Um, but as, as Evan mentioned, there's 14,000 of them, um, which is a lot to process. So Robert, you may have a question in the chat. Ooh. All right. Share the fellowship link in chat. Let's see. Let's see if I can do that. So you can tell it me. Between Zoom and PowerPoint, <laughs> that may be a challenge. Um, so there's. I'll try to do this if I can do it. Were there other questions while we wait for that to happen? Yes. So I'm curious about uh, the, uh, the the questions that you posed at the, the beginning about um, did COVID kill the video store? Uh, was would there have been a way to save it uh, if we hadn't had the pandemic? Um, um, were there uh, alternative business strategies that uh, co-ops and other places uh, try or video stores, uh, mom and pop stores? Uh, that, that enabled them to uh, survive the, the loss of foot traffic during the lockdowns in 2020. And we have several people in the room who have looked at all the interviews or done one of the interviews. Yeah. Anybody have any takes on that? I think the short answer is that it's complicated. Um, I think that the uh, from what I understand from the interviews, it seems like COVID accelerated certain issues, um, but that there were issues that predated COVID for sure. Um, and so it was kind of like a perfect storm of events um, mm -hmm. uh, that lasted a, a relatively long Yeah. I think between the video streaming services and the fact that there's a red box in front of every grocery store in town, yeah. there were probably some, some challenges that were going to catch up to them either way. So looking ahead to uh, your next oral history project, I wonder if uh, anyone proposed doing 50 years of the Moscow Food Co-op uh, in 2023, and if so, uh, how and when would you start uh, uh, um, outlining your, your scope and, and goals as you, you did for this one? If we were going to do that, we'd probably need to start as soon as possible. We have been digitizing their newsletter. Um, we're working with them to that extent on the 50th anniversary celebration. Um, there's also the Women's Center at Peelby that has the 50th anniversary this year as well. And so we've been digitizing theirs newsletters. So there's been a lot of newsletter digitization, but um, it would be a great idea to also start doing some oral history projects in those areas as well. Why don't you ask if there are other questions from the, the Zoom audience? Uh, oh, and, and the Moscow uh, Farmers Market. Uh, so apparently, this was a happen in place 50 years ago. Uh, and Dusty is saying that he uh, has reached out to the Moscow Food Co op to assist with oral history collections. At this point, you'd probably get in touch with yourself, um, Robert Parrott on email to uh, start these conversations and also to comment more and contribute to this uh, Main Street video, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we're so open to uh, people giving us their own recollections of Main Street video. There's still opportunities here if people want to contribute their own Main Street video stories. 
our Howard Hughes video stories. Um, we're still very open to those sorts of discussions. Let's see, I'm just gonna scroll up on chat to make sure I didn't miss anything else. Are there any other questions here in the room or on chat? Video game rental should be explored. Yeah, if you were around, in, uh, I think a business model in the early 90s was to make very terrible video games that were good just long enough for people to rent them one weekend and then make <laughs> the mistake of renting them a second weekend. Um, so I definitely have some access to grind if you want to have an axe grindy video game rental oral history <laughs> project. <laughs> Well, yeah, if you have any oral history projects you'd like to propose, we're more than happy to work with people on that and either support your project or work with you on doing that. I just asked about the uh, trailer that uh, on Wednesday. Is it available to the public yet? Is, 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 and how would we get there? The uh, so the, the link, um, I shared it in the chat and I'll share it to you via email. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the website is up. You can get it on that link that we shared in the chat, uh, but we, we don't have it currently listed um, on our digital collections page, but it will be listed fairly shortly. Um, so you won't immediately find it uh, if you go searching for it, um, but you'll find it in the email that I sent to you. All right, thank you very much, because I know other people will like Yeah. Well, thank you to the team of uh, library staff and the How Howard Hughes uh, video fellow uh, for your, uh, participation. Uh, I it was a fascinating presentation, and I would say that even if I uh, was not among the the interview subjects. Uh, so it was <laughs> a, a big part of my life from uh, 1978 to uh, 2020. And uh, uh, as the slide uh, treated it like a uh, a memorial slide of those uh, 42 years, it was a, a big part of the community and. Uh, uh, as uh, several of the speakers said, it uh, enhanced Moscow's downtown, and I think Moscow's downtown would uh, enhance uh, the, the video co-op. Uh, so uh, thank you to our, present, uh, our presenters today, and uh, if uh, uh, maybe we can uh, end, end the share, and uh, uh, if, if we wanted to invite our audience, if you wanted to uh, either put up a hand in chat or uh, turn on your camera and uh, give a, uh, <laughs> a, a round of applause to uh, the speakers that uh, we heard today. Let's go to a gallery view there and uh, seeing uh, a few few faces uh, and uh, uh, just to invite everyone uh, that uh, next week's program. Uh, will be Tuesday, March 29th. Uh, Judge Molly Husky of the Idaho Court of Appeals. Uh, that presentation will be uh, in the College of Law, the room 104 of the Menard Law Building, and also on the regular Zoom, um, the same link that you use to join this meeting today. Uh, and uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, March 23rd, uh, five o'clock, the uh, Africana Studies Distinguished Speaker Lecture with Charles Blow, uh, New York Times columnist. So uh, if you uh, Google uh, Charles Blow U of I uh, or look on the U of I calendar of events, you can get the registration link for that. Uh, so uh, thank you to our team. Thank you to our audience uh, in person and our audience on Zoom. Uh, so have a uh, good rest of the week, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday uh, as the Renfrew Colloquium continues its spring uh, 2022 series.